Welcome to the show. I'm sitting here with Professor Yehuda Bauer. It's the, uh, he knows everything about the Holocaust. Or? Well, if I knew everything about the Holocaust, I would be uh, studying it. <laughs> uh, but I am a Holocaust scholar, yes. Yeah. Did you, can, can you tell us, did you work, start your work with Simon Wiesenthal? No, uh, I knew Simon Wiesenthal, we had contact and uh, he visited here and we had long talks and so on. But uh, he did one thing which is uh, uh, hunting Nazis and I did quite another thing which is uh, trying to find out what happened uh, during uh, World War II to the Jews. So his, his thing was to get the Nazis to trial? Yes. And uh, I was quite willing to help him if I could, but... Uh, With the information that, was, that you had? Yeah, but I had no... I <clears> mean, this was not my, uh, my purpose. It's because you were not in, involved in... No, I'm in just... I'm, I, I deal with it, period. Not with the... Uh, uh, hunting the Nazis afterwards. Mm. That's his... Uh, Did you help him? I don't know. You would have had to ask him mm. what I told him was any use to him. Mm. I, don't I don't really know. Ask his. I was reading that the other day, uh, when you were in Sweden, as a matter of fact, that... Uh, it's one of the countries in, in Europe that never had anything to do with their with their time of between 1940 uh, 39 to 47 because they they just we didn't know anything we didn't. but Sweden known as a a lot of Nazis uh, uh, people a lot of Nazis in Sweden lived in Sweden like Heinrich Himmler no, he never lived in Sweden, but uh, 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 Swedish and other scholars have written about uh, the relationship of Sweden to the Holocaust. So I can just repeat what, uh, what they uh, found Is and also from my own research. Uh, of course they knew, uh, as much as uh, people knew in the West at all, uh, which until... Uh, uh, but the middle of 1942 was very little because uh, the mass murder of the Jews in Poland started in March 1942. The uh, mass murder of the Jews in the occupied Soviet Union started almost a year earlier than that. And there was very little that was known about it in the West. You mean Ukraine or and yeah in in the occupied Belarus. Soviet Union. All right. Yeah. Uh, in actual fact, uh, the person who brought the first reliable information to London was a Swede. His name was Sven Norman. He uh, was a Swedish businessman who was uh, uh, stationed in. Uh, Warsaw, and did export-import business between Germany, uh, Nazi Germany, and Sweden, which was something that Swedish businessmen did. Yeah, well, we Norway. know about that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Now he uh, was in contact with the Polish underground. He represented a Swedish uh, uh, company. And the local manager was a member, serious member of the uh, Polish underground. Also, he had a uh, secretary who he found out very soon was posing as an Aryan Pole, which actually was Jewish. And through the, uh, this man, not the woman, not, not the secretary, but through the man, he got... Uh, a uh, uh, document which was composed by uh, the Jewish underground in uh, Poland at the time and uh, which reported for the first time in the greatest detail what the uh, Germans were doing to the Jews in Poland. In Poland. Yeah. Now he <coughs> uh, 
he, he spoke fluent Polish, of course. Uh, he uh, arranged for a, uh, a piece of luggage which had a double bottom and he put the uh, document in there and he decided to smuggle it to Sweden. If he had been found, he would probably have been shot on the spot by the German. Uh, he uh, uh, went to Sweden uh, on actually on the 22nd of May 1942 and uh, in he managed to get it through. He, d he was not found. Uh, and in Sweden he contacted the representatives of the Polish government in exile in London. In London. Yeah, there was a Swede <coughs> they had a person in Sweden representing them. And uh, they uh, had a contact by a Swedish airline, News for Sweden, yeah. which was flying from Sweden to Scotland. And they um, flew that document to Scotland and then by railway to London to the Polish government in exile, which at first this was unbelievable what was said in the document. So they hesitated whether they should publish it. But then the... Uh, Who hesitated? The English? Uh, no, the, the Polish, Polish government oh, in exile. Okay. Yeah? In the end they decided that this was reliable and uh, they published the document. Actually the Polish prime minister in exile, Sikorski, was he Jew? No, a Pole. This is Polish government. I know, but I you heard... Couldn't, you couldn't have a Jew in a Polish government. There's no... No way. In, in media, the other day in the media, when yeah. they were talking about this thing in what happening with the new law in Poland, do you know? Yeah. And then they says, one of the reporters says, the, the exile government in London, the Polish exile government in London, which one of them was a Jew, insisted that they would publish this document. Is This is crap. Stupid. Okay. Absolutely stupid. There were two Jewish representatives in what was a kind of a parliament in London. It was a, a large number exile of... Exile government. Exile, yes. Yeah. No, no member of the Polish government in exile could be a Jew. But the Polish uh, prime minister published this. And then the British took it up and it was spread all over the Western media. Uh, so uh, from that point on, of course, uh, everybody in the Anglo-American side who wanted to know, because it was published all over the newspapers, and of course in Sweden who read the papers, uh, knew about the situation in Poland. And this was due to this very unusual man, Fred Norman, who, uh, who, had who did not go back to Poland, of course. Of course. Yeah, he stayed in Sweden and he died, I think, in 1979 or this, something this like that. Yad Vashem? But, no, nothing to do with Yad Vashem. No, I said, does any other Jewish uh, institute of the Holocaust knows about this guy? No, we didn't know. I didn't know about this until about half a year ago. I found it out through research. Uh, Sven Norman, after the war, did not want to talk about it because uh, he was afraid that, uh, you know, there were six businessmen. He was one of them. After he went to Sweden with a document, the Germans, of course, immediately found out that it was he who had smuggled it. And they were looking so for they him. So arrested, they arrested the other five who spent the war years in a German prison. And after the war, they accused Fred Norman of being responsible for their being arrested. Arresting. So mm. he didn't want to get into trouble with them. So he kept quiet. He, he, not completely. He told people here and there. But uh, he did not publicize it in any way. Because it's a new name. I never heard this name. I know. You don't, hey, I... I mentioned it in Sweden to yeah, the I know. S Swedish government people. They didn't know. How should they know? They couldn't know because it was never published in Sweden. 
does the Yad Vashem, no, anybody I, would know? No. No, uh, would do something yes, for I, him? Yes, we now have a, I initiated in Yad Vashem a procedure to find out more about it, find documentation. There must be documentation in the Swedish archives, but nobody until now has tried to find out. So this is still in the future. Some students, um, MA student or somebody, sooner or later will go into the archives and find the documentation. Because obviously the Swedish intelligence service, after this happened, uh, found out exactly what, who was what and so on. So they just covered it? No, they didn't cover it. There was no, in 1942, to you publish this, was endangering Swedish neutrality. So obviously they wouldn't do that. Uh, Sweden started abandoning its pro-German policies towards the end of 1942. Uh, they didn't like the Nazis, but they were afraid because the German army could occupy Sweden in a matter of a week. The Swedish army was no match for the German forces. Mm. It's an amazing story to know that there is another Hasid Olam, Hasid Umota Olam. Is that the name? Yeah. A, a person like that should Wallenberg. have. Yeah, but uh, Wallenberg is a different story. No, but uh, this title of. of it... The title is there are 26,000 people who are recognized as what is in English known as righteous. The uh, righteous, but right. uh, uh, like Schindler. Oster yeah, Schindler yeah, it's and over twenty-six. Raoul Wallenberg. Yeah. So this guy could get into that. So sooner or later, he will most probably uh, get the recognition. Mm. I d we don't even know yet whether uh, there are any family members who are connected with him who live today in Sweden. He, we know that he did not have children. He had an he had an adopted daughter. We don't know what happened to her. People are still trying to find out. What well, well, we can help you do that in Sweden. I, I, I would like to ask you something that is uh, troubling a lot of people. The new law of Poland. What's the deal with this? There is a radically nationalist Polish government. Now? Yes. Who want to... Uh, <coughs> follow an agenda of uh, a basically anti-liberal policy and they are trying to revise the history of World War II. Now, uh, this is not done openly, of course. The legal position is that they are, tr they, they passed the law, it's been passed, it's been accepted. Uh, uh, by Just the two houses of parliament yeah. and signed by the president, which threatens with uh, jail and a heavy financial fine anyone who argues that the Polish people or the Polish nation was in any way uh, connected, connected to with, the, uh, with the crimes of the Nazis in Poland. Now, nobody argues that the Polish nation was responsible because there was no Polish nation under German occupation. There was an underground, and the underground was overwhelmingly anti-Semitic. There were pro-Jewish pro elements in the underground, but they were a small minority. They uh, managed to rescue some Jews, mm. but the... Uh, large majority of the underground, both the civilian and the military underground, uh, were very much against the Jews. And... Uh, even the un underground... Um... Not even, the underground. All right. <laughs> there was even a part of the underground, they joined the major uh, move, underground military movement, in 1943, they were called the NSZ, NSZ, which was basically a fascist Polish military underground, which collaborated with the Germans for a while, 
afterwards now, and they murder Jews. And they joined the underground in 1943, and the present Polish Prime Minister, a few days ago, laid a wreath of flowers in memory of the NSZ. Yeah, yeah? we saw that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you have a... Uh, now, I'm, I'm not saying that the government is anti-Semitic, but it is following a trend in the public which is, in, in essence, an anti-Semitic trend. Uh, and uh, they, it is more than that. It is a, an attack on Polish liberalism, on uh, the rule of law. They are now in a situation where the governing party, which has a majority, an absolute majority in parliament, is n nominates the judges. In other words, this is no longer independent. No judiciary. democracy, real democracy. It is, it is anti-democratic. Now, there are still strong elements of democracy in Poland. Mm. And there's a strong minority, minority of uh, Polish liberals, including a large group of wonderful Polish historians, uh, who have uh, examined all this, are continuing to examine all this, and not, not uh, closing their eyes to the real heroism of a uh, large number of Poles, of course a small minority, who uh, rescued Jews. Not only rescued Jews, but who people who did not rescue Jews, but who helped them along the way. So we, we don't close our eyes to that. In fact, we recognize the largest number of writers recognized by Yad Vashem are Poles. So we are, we are, we are not anti-Polish, but we are against the anti-democratic tendencies in the Polish government. Revisionism. I, I wanted to ask, do you know anything about this Norman person, Sven Norman? I don't know. I. Uh, uh, when I was in Sweden recently, I asked uh, some friends to find a uh, Swedish professor in one of the universities who will have an MA student and put that MA student to write an MA thesis about Sven Norman, which is the obvious thing to do, because then as a MA student he will get access to uh, Swedish uh, Archives, Ar archives, which are open, they are completely open, there's no mm. problem. And uh, of course it's a huge archive and you have to work very hard to find, you know, do you, do a, you needle, know? a needle in the haystack, in the haystack. Stack, yes. Do you know if any uh, professor have, have been thinking of that? No. Or that I, your friend? No, I mean. no. I, I asked a representative of the Swedish Foreign Office to find out but this is something that has to be done in Sweden. It can't be done in Jerusalem. I know, but I, do you know any professor in, in, in Sweden? Oh, there are plenty of people, wonderful uh, scholars, historians and so on, who uh, teach, whether in Lund or in Uppsala or in Stockholm uh, or some other place, uh, 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 who uh, can take this on. It's, you know, uh, it's very simple, really. You have a number of students, they come to you and they ask you, do you have any idea of something interesting that I could do, you know, in my work? So if a young person of 20, 22, 23 years of age goes to a professor and says, I would like to write an MA thesis on something really interesting, mm. they can say, well... Try it's Sven Norman. It. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. But it's got to be done in Sweden. It can't be done outside because you have to go, you have to run from one place to the other in Sweden. You have to try to find out whether uh, Norman had any uh, relatives, siblings, or and, uh, yeah, and and further relatives because uh, uh, then we might find out more about his background and so on. We don't really know much. Are there any other Swedish? Uh people that are relevant, that either helped the Nazis or that you know of? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, there was a Swedish Nazi party, okay. yeah? And uh, there was a, uh, there were economic interests. 
the uh, iron ore in Kiruna were a major source for German armaments. Yeah. yeah. So they, they were shipped, yeah, uh, either through the Baltic or through Darwick. Most of them through Narvik because Lulia is uh, is uh, blocked by ice in the winter. So uh, Narvik was uh, occupied by no, by the Nazis too. He, so. Well, that's all right because we you you sold the iron ore to the Nazis. Yeah. So that was fine. Yeah, yeah. that was easier that way. Yeah, it was, and the, the distance to Narvik is quite short. Shorter so. than Lulia. No, it's about the same, but it's short. You go, and and the railway was there, so. Uh, no problem, and the people who were in charge of uh, of uh, the uh, the company that was running uh, uh, Kiruna uh, were, of course, interested in making money. So they sold the iron ore, and the Swedish government was uh, afraid of a German invasion. Look, Sweden was surrounded by German occupied or German allied countries. Norway was occupied, Denmark was occupied, the Baltic coast was occupied, Finland was a... Soviet German. occupied or no, a Nazi. It was an ally of the Nazis. Yeah. Yeah? So uh, Sweden was alone there and there was no way to break out. So the Swedes are very, very scared. The point is that we know today that the Nazis never thought of uh, occupying Sweden because... There's not was, enough Jews there. No, nothing to do with Jews. <laughs> but simply because uh, it was much more uh, productive for them and a sort of peaceful situ situation to get the iron ore without any problem, you know, from Sweden. They were not interested in Sweden as such. They were interested in the iron. Yeah, of, of Kiruna. You know, the other day, just a week, a couple of weeks ago, a very famous Swede um, passed away. Uh, his name is <coughs> Ingvar Kamprad. Hmm? Ingvar Kamprad is oh, the Ikea. owner of Ikea. Ikea. Yeah, well, he was a Nazi, pro-Nazi, yeah. Yeah, I know. but... Uh, <coughs> Uh, when he died, everybody was like this and this, but the, the Communist Party in Sweden and the left was just like, oh, it's another Nazi who died. Yeah. But when he was talking about his history, his biography with the, a very famous uh, Swedish reporter, he already talked about it and <clears throat> make stories here and there and there and there and apologize yeah, and all well, that. Yeah, uh, well, he was... Uh, but, you know, you, you, you have people like that, so uh, it's not very surprising <laughs> you have that. I mean, you had... Uh, 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 Sir Norman was working for a uh, company, Swedish company, which was under the control of the Wallenberg family. In actual fact, I, I do know that on one occasion he was part of a group of businessmen who met with Markus Wallenberg in order to plan business. Venture. Sven Norman, you're talking Sven about. Sven Norman, yeah. yeah. Uh, but again, uh, the fact that he met with Markus Wallenberg doesn't mean anything. It just means that he was invited to a meeting, you know. Mm. Uh, again, uh, it's got to be found out, uh, not you know, uh, I'm not uh, trying to uh, grab headlines. No, no, we... <laughs> That's not my, my line. Yeah, but, you know, uh, a lot of people in Sweden knows that Valenberg family did make a business with, uh, with the Nazis in Germany. But everybody did business with the Nazis mm -hmm. in Sweden. Everybody did, because... You, there was no way, really, to do business with anyone else. Uh, all the row, all the all the uh, sea lanes were controlled by the Germans. Yes, so there were Swedish neutral ships that co could go through, but that was minor. Yeah, they did have contact with England. Yeah, mm. and of course the Swedish government, which was largely social democratic at the time, did not like the situation. 
but they thought that they had no way out. They, the only way was to try to keep neutral as much as possible. And that changed then uh, as a result of, uh, partly also because of the knowledge of what Germans were doing, not only to the Jews, but generally, and uh, partly uh, because the Germans got stuck in the Soviet Union in the second half of 1942. They were still advancing. There uh, was still a possibility of the Germans conquering Stalingrad. But Stalingrad began, the German struggle for Stalingrad began in September 1942. And uh, it took almost half a year until they were defeated. So uh, during that time, the Swedes slowly changed their policy. Uh, they accepted in uh, November and a bit later as well a part of the very small uh, Norwegian Jewish community which was smuggled over the mountains mm. by the Norwegian underground. And they had to be accepted by the Swedish government, otherwise they couldn't have done it. And then the Swedish government in October 43, but that is well known, uh, declared openly that they would accept uh, uh, Jews from Denmark. They, they announced it publicly. No long, they were no longer that much afraid of the Germans. Because huh? they know their, their German, Nazi Germany is getting defeating. It's, 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 it's in trouble. So the, the Germans are not going to attack Sweden now. Huh? They don't want to have a new front. No. Yeah. So, well, most of them went over the mountains. In uh, Dalarna, uh, in uh, Värmland, there, up there. Mm. Yeah. Does the Yad Vashem still chasing or looking for Nazis or in Sweden no, or yeah, in yeah. Europe? Uh, Yad Vashem never did. That's not the job of, of Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem's job is? Is to uh, create a memory and to do historical research. Uh, the fate of the Nazis after the war is, is something very important, but Yad Vashem, uh, decades ago, decided that was not what it was going to do. Somebody else will do it. They know, they won't. Uh, that's where Simon Wiesenthal and other people came in. Yes, and there were people in Israel too who were doing it, and still are doing it. Mm. Yeah? I mean, the, the uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center uh, has a uh, representative here, a very important person, who uh, till this day is trying to find out about, uh, especially in Eastern Europe, collaborators with the Nazis. Uh, in Eastern Europe? In Eastern Europe, in uh, Lithuania, Soviets, Latvia, yeah. Hungary and so on. Uh, but these are very old people now. It's no longer really something that, you know, preoccupies you. It's, uh, uh, it's much more important today to find out what these Nazis did rather than what happened to them after the war. I want to ask you one big question that we're talking about in Sweden. All this turning up now to anti-Semitism in, in Sweden and in Poland in Belgium, Holland, everywhere. Is, is there any possibility they would have another Holocaust? No, I don't think so. Uh, the uh, uh, anti-Semitism certainly is a major problem. Uh, not so much for the Jews, actually, but for the countries in which it happens, because it destroys the structure of society. You have some, what, some 20,000 Jews in Sweden. Uh, that's a uh, tiny percentage of the population. Uh, so anti-Semitism eats into the democratic structure of the Swedish society. And the same applies to other countries in Europe. Uh, the major threat of anti-Semitism is actually not in Europe, but in the Muslim world. Uh, again, much of the Muslim world is not anti-Semitic, but qu quite a large proportion is. And uh, anti-Semitism is sort of a consensus in certain Muslim countries. 
in others it is not. So again, you have to differentiate, yeah? But uh, the threat is real, very real, because uh, in uh, radical Islam, uh, the Jews, like with the Nazis, the Jews are the uh, group that moves the whole world, yeah? That's the accusation. And, uh, we run the world. <laughs> all over the world, yeah. And uh, so Islamic radicalism, which is attacking all democracy, all in the West, is also very much uh, targeting the Jews. Uh, I don't think that this will result in a physical danger. For the Jews? Yeah. But it does result in a danger. Of, yeah. for, the, for democracies in and the also West? Also to the Jews, of course. Mm. Yeah. But it's not... You see, uh, you have to be careful when you... It attacks the Jews. Anti-Semitism obviously attacks the Jews. But anti-Semitism attacks the societies in which it develops. Oh, there never was. I mean, that, that, oh. was, eaten, that was eaten up by the Nazis. They, uh, they got... Uh, uh, certain amounts of uh, gold from uh, the victims. They use it to buy arms, to buy all kinds of things. It doesn't exist anymore, long time ago. Uh, there was a train from Hungary mm. with property and probably also some gold, uh, which was uh, stopped on the Swiss border. Uh, at the end of the war. The, the Nazis were trying to smuggle the train into Switzerland, due to Switzerland, in order to get the property and the gold and so on. Into the Swiss. It was stopped on the border uh, by the Americans, by the American army that was advancing. And the American soldiers just stole it. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So, there's no, no gold to go on a little search no, for. No, 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 no. What was the most interesting thing you found under all this research you've done? Well, look, I started researching the Holocaust uh, about 70 years ago. I'm now 92. So you can't ask me a question like that. It's, it's uh, uh, constantly you find fascinating things. Like Sven Norman. Yeah, well, that's just <laughs> one, one of very many cases, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, I just uh, got a manuscript in Slovak, which I read Slovak, mm -hmm. uh, on one of the SKP, one of the Jewish SKPs from Auschwitz, which I didn't know about. Somebody else found, yeah? And it was not my... My manuscript. Mm. I just found it. Mm. Well, uh, I found, uh, I, I, I made a research on the fate of small Jewish communities in, uh, in uh, so Soviet areas that were occupied by the Germans uh, to find out what happened to each one of them. You know? In Czechoslovakia? Not, or in, no, no, in Soviet, in Soviet. Oc occupied Soviet territory. All right. So today it's Belarus and Ukraine and so on. Mm. And uh, this was a fascinating research. And I found, uh, I mean, obviously one re has to rely on the people who survived. The people who were killed cannot give you any information. Mm. So it's always you have to realize that you don't know, you can't get to the bottom of these things properly because the vast majority of people uh, who could have told you are, uh, are dead. Mm. Uh, so I found out a lot of fascinating uh, things about the relationship between the Jews in these places and the local population, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, the Russians and so on. Uh, I found cases of Jews rescuing non-Jews. Jews rescuing, rescuing yeah. non-Jews during the Holocaust. Huh? 
in situations where uh, Jews uh, rescued uh, Soviet prisoners of war. Mm. Yeah, or where they supplied food to starving prisoners of war. They didn't have enough either, but they supplied some food. So you have the other way around. Not only rescue of Jews by non-Jews, but also rescue of yeah, the way around, Jews, yeah. uh, uh, which I had not even imagined before I got into this. You have uh, a lot of uh, uh, things that destroy stereotypical images. You know, all Poles are this, and all, all Poles are that, or all Ukrainians are this or that. It, it, it changes. It's 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 uh, uh, there are no stereotypes. There are no stereotypes of Jews either. They behave differently in different situations. But it's good to come that things like that comes up, make yeah. Life well, that's that's nicer. the whole point in in trying to uh, make your research public. Uh, it's not going to ever. It's never going to sell. You know, like fiction. But uh, uh, it'll go through universities and large numbers of students who read and so on and so forth. So this is what you work for when you are a historian. Do, do you know of any other um, righteous Gentiles in, in Sweden that you have found in your research? Righteous Gentiles from Sweden? Yes. Were there any in your research? Well, uh, apart from Wallenberg, yeah That's well Norman yeah well we have uh, of course uh, uh, the people who worked with Wallenberg in Budapest Per Anger Per Anger yeah, yeah and uh, Danielson there were there were a number of Swedish diplomats yes who uh, worked in, in Hungary yeah they no they are known yeah uh, there was there was no direct <laughs> contact <laughs> of Swedes with Germans killing Jews, you know, so, so it's not surprising. And Wahlberg actually was picked up by accident, yeah? He had this, uh, his, his business partner was a Hungarian Jew, huh? who lived in Sweden. And they, they teamed up, they, they were partners in a, uh, in a trading company. His name was Coloman Lauer, and uh, so before the famous uh, rescue of Jews in Budapest by Wallenberg, Wallenberg visited Hungary before that for business purposes. So he knew Hungary before that. But, but yeah. he didn't know much about what's going on. He was not interested. He was interested in making money. Yeah. Like any businessman, mm. he, and he was trying to help his partner. Coloman Lauer had his family in Budapest. So Wallenberg obviously tried to help them as much as he could before mm. the Germans occupied Budapest. And uh, uh, he had no... Uh, Wallenberg actually spent some time in Haifa in the 1930s. As a, uh, he was, uh, he was a very young man. He was uh, beginning to go into the banking business. Huh? So there was a bank, a branch of the Waldberg family branch, yeah, a bank in Haifa, and he worked there for a few months. He had no contact with either Jews or Arabs or anyone. He was just concentrating on, on banking, making the, make, making the money. Yeah, you're learning the banking business, yeah. That was all that interesting. But he had this streak in him, probably, of, uh, of uh, humanitarianism, uh, which... Empathy of, to human... Of, of empathy to people who were suffering. Mm. And then he went to America, and from America, he was uh, suggested to the Swedish government as a... Um, as a, as a, for a mission to Budapest uh, uh, by the American, an American, actually a Norwegian American, <laughs> a man who was born in Norway, went to 
his parents or somebody went to America. He was an American citizen. And he was uh, the representative in Sweden of the uh, American Intelligence Agency, OSS. Officially, he was a member, he was representing a, uh, the War Refugee Board, which was dealing with refugees. But in actual fact, he was a representative of the American Intelligence Agency. And he was the one who suggested Waldberg to the Swedish government. Why? Because he had made, he had got to, gotten to know Lauer, the uh, partner of Wallenberg. In Budapest. In Sweden. In Sweden. The Lauer was in Sweden. Mm -hmm. He was not in Budapest. Lauer was a refugee in Sweden. Huh? Now, how, why, why Budapest? Because of Lauer. Mm. And uh, so this was a uh, adventure. You know, you mustn't forget, uh, Wallenberg was a young man. He was looking for adventure as well, you know? apart from everything else. And so he got this thing and he got involved in it. And so he actually wrote two reports which you don't have. We, we got lost somewhere. Uh, two reports that he wrote to the uh, American Intelligence Agency from Budapest. But there was nothing much he could tell them. He was dealing with Jews. They wanted to know about the German army and what they were doing and so on. The American intelligence. And he didn't know. <laughs> How could he know? He was trying to help some Jewish people in, in Budapest. So uh, we don't really know what he, what he told them. But do you know if, the, if there are... Do you, what do you think happened to him? Oh, that's quite clear. They to me, him. it's very clear. Mm. He, he was the the Soviets found out that he was a agent of the American intelligence service. So that's why Sweden yeah. didn't want to ask yeah, so for Sweden, him to yeah. be released. Yeah, and he was uh, executed probably at Stalin's direct order. Probably, we don't really know. In 1947. So, to me, this is perfectly clear. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right. I thank you very much, Professor You're Bauer. Right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> See you next program.